What do you think about Dan Lanning at Oregon? I've been getting some weird comments on Dan Lanning. It kind of hit a crescendo today, so I figured I'd toss it in the show tonight. There's a weird thing happening with him. It's sort of a weird modern thing that happens in college football. This dude has been a head coach all of two years, going into his third year now at Oregon. He is 22-5 and five as a head coach, not a typo. Got two top 15 finishes. They're recruiting at a top five level, maybe better this point moving forward. They've been assassins in the transfer portal. And so I say that to someone who doesn't know me any better, and I, they'd say, that sounds great. This guy sounds like one of the best head coaches in the game. That's good, right? Nope. Nope. Not according to trusted internet sources, it's not. <clears throat> I put out a tweet today, and I said, uh, let, me, let me actually get you the exact quote. It was a classic fill-in-the-blank. What a revolutionary concept I came up with there, fill-in-the-blank. Dan Landing's next five years will blank. Got a ton of comments, uh, got a ton of traction on this. Here were some words. Uh, the word can't was involved a lot. He can't win the big game. That won't change. He never will. You know, Oregon will just be talented, but they never will get over the hump. They'll choke against better teams. Uh, what has he won you know, the age-old go-to there, what has he won? Two years. Dude's been a head coach. Two years. He can't. He won't. He'll, he never will. These people are not joking. I, I saw Bud Elliott going back and forth with someone today, and the, the dude was just saying, well, Dan Lanning always, always what? Dan Lanning doesn't always even park in the same spot at the football facility. He hasn't been there long enough. So anyway, the book's apparently been written on Dan Lanning. You remember how I explained wish casting to you the other day? It happens. It's happening with Dan Lanning. Here's some truth serum for you. I think a lot of the Big Ten, if they're smart enough, should be fairly terrified with what Oregon's doing right now, but they don't want to be. Just like me, growing up in Georgia as a winter weather fan, did not want to accept the fact that it was going to be 68 degrees on Christmas Day. I wanted a white Christmas. So what did I do? Never mind the fact that it's the first week of December and there is no dependable long-term forecast out. I just start blindly believing it's going to snow this Christmas. This is the Christmas. Forts in Georgia, it's going to snow this Christmas. December 10th, December 15th, December 20th, the, the 15, 10, five-day forecast, not looking good, but I just wish cast it, you know, because that's how snow actually happens. Well, sure enough, Christmas morning, rooster crows, 63 degrees and sunny. What happened? The same thing that's happening to those foolish enough to think Dan Lanning, all of two years in, has taught you everything you need to know about what he and Oregon will be as both a head coach and a program moving forward. So I am to believe that two years in, since this dude has lost a couple of games to Washington, uh, since he got boat raced by Georgia in game one of year one as a head coach, that's it. That's it. We've learned everything we need to know. You, because the one thing we know about Nick Saban, for example, is he never lost early in his career, did he? Well, oh, getting word Nick Saban lost plenty. In fact, I'm, get, I'm getting word Nick Saban wasn't remotely what you know Nick Saban as until years into his coaching career. We don't afford guys the time to do that anymore, I guess. I got a story for you. Once upon a time. This is worth, worth the paper pop here. Once upon a time, there was a head coach that got his shot. And he was a promising up-and-comer, pretty big name in the assistant coaching world, a really good recruiter. And he took this new job, high-profile job, and he won pretty quickly. And he recruited at a very high level. And it had amazing intensity and energy. And the program quickly came to adopt his energy and his identity. However... There were critics. There were critics who, after a few chances in big games where they came up short, said, he just can't win the big one. He just can't get it. They just can't get over the hump. And this dude's name was Kirby Smart. And no one who was ignorant enough to say it about him at the time is ever around to admit they said it. But I promise you, they said it about this man. They said he can't get over the hump. He can't win the big one. Georgia's just, they compared him to Mark Richt. Jesse, you remember this, right? Colin was with me the first time we ever did this show in Nashville at 24-7 and CBS. At the time, one of our first shows we did, it was because 
people were, were floating around one of these popular graphics that used to circulate the internet. For some reason, I don't see them anymore. And it was this split screen. And it was Kirby Smart's first fill-in-the-blank years, and it was Mark Rick's first fill-in-the-blank years. And they looked really similar. The numbers looked really similar. And it was supposed to lead you to believe that Georgia fired Mark Rick and just got Mark Rick 2.0. Uh, by the way, that's not a terrible thing because Rick wasn't a terrible coach. But the point was, that graphic doesn't get circulated anymore. Because the same people who use words like can't and won't ever, they're the same people who make that graphic, not understanding there's a big difference between have not and cannot. Uh, Kirby Smart had not won a title at that point. He has since won multiples and, and probably not done winning them. Dan Landing right now, there's a lot of things he has not done yet that maybe cannot is the wrong word for they aren't stopping is all i know at oregon the effort right now the stacking of elite recruiting classes is not going to stop i don't even know if they'll make the playoff this year i'd will I'd be willing to bet they are i don't know if they'll win the big 10 in year one i'd be willing to bet they'll be a big factor in it even if they don't I don't care if they go 9-3 and three and miss out on the thing entirely this year. They'll be right back in the conversation next year, and then the year after that, and the year after that, because they're not a window program. Oregon, once upon a time, was kind of fashioned as a place where if you build and you build and you build, and you look two years down the road, you can circle that year and say, all right, well, we got this team. If we can hold it together, we may have a puncher's chance that year. That's not Oregon anymore, because Dan Lanning did what I thought was impossible, he built an SEC program on the West Coast. The last one to remotely come close to doing something like that was Pete Carroll in the early 2000s, and that's when that term SEC program didn't even mean what it means now because the SEC as a conference was not then what it ended up becoming and what it long since has been now. Lanning's exposure to head coaches has included working under Nick Saban and working under Kirby Smart. And if you were to copy-paste those guys, and drop it in Eugene, Oregon, you'd basically have Dan Lanning. So they nailed their coaching hire. He has returned and returned and returned on that investment in the way of building a roster that's going to be a sustainable year-over-year -year contender. And what you do is the same thing you do at Bama, same thing you do at Georgia, same thing you do at Ohio State. You get the best players. you got to be relentless. You, you can never have too many. You, you can... It's like watching a squirrel store up nuts for the winter. You fill those cheeks as much as you can. Or in this case, you fill that roster as much as you can. you got to be as selfish and as cutthroat as possible because injury happens. But also, you're eventually going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the few other programs in America that recruit the same way you do. All due respect, they're not stacking this roster because they got to face Purdue. They're stacking that roster because they got to face Georgia one day. They got to face Ohio State. They got to face Texas. They got to go through Alabama. They know who they have to go through. They'll be in that conversation every year. Anyone who suggests otherwise is suggesting it a lot more out of wishing than guided knowledge. So I took it upon myself to bookmark a whole lot of this stuff today because a lot of the things that I, I think they have not done so far are about to get crossed off a list in the not too distant future. And then what do you say? Just talk about Phil Knight. I guess talking about Nike, you know, as if that's not part of the game these days.